Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Can I get a quick poll from the audience um, on digital assets here? How many people have PA personal investments in anything digital related? OK, maybe about half. And can you keep your hands up if you are professionally invested on behalf of your institution? Got it. So maybe from 50% to 15%, roughly? That's a good, a good starting point. OK, so our panel today is the evolution of digital assets. And I think in a lot of ways, this is the transition from a world of digital asset beta into digital asset alpha. Because I think five years ago, 10 years ago, we would be having a panel talking about, uh, is this asset class here to stay? Well, it's absolutely here to stay. We're a $1.3, $1.5 trillion asset right now, which is the same size as the high yield industry. Um, I think the difference is it hasn't been readily accepted by the institutional community uh, the way that, for example, high yield as an asset class is. And I think that is actually the opportunity. The opportunity is that we're now um, still seeing the allocations from institutions into this, into this new asset class. Um, the other part of the beta to alpha evolution is that years ago we were talking only about the, the potential for blockchain to disrupt large swaths of the economy. And today, when you accept that digital assets are here to stay, you can construct market neutral portfolios that produce pure alpha to complement that beta. So I think those are some of the exciting themes we're gonna talk about today. And before we get into it, I would like to um, just let everyone introduce themselves, um, a little bit about their firm and what they're doing in digital assets. And if you won't mind and humor me, your favorite um, digital asset use case. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Vidak for having us and for organizing this amazing event. My name is Paola Origel, and I'm the co-founder of Chainlink Capital Management, not related to the protocol. We're a hedge fund of funds. Uh, we launched the firm in 2017. Oh, and my... <laughs> I am bullish um, about emerging technologies, not only blockchain, but AI, and the synergy between them uh, to build the new infrastructure for every industry in the future. But if I want to be a specific, I'm very excited about remittances. Um, the World Bank released a report saying that today the market value is over $600 billion. Uh, the average uh, fee for each transaction worldwide is between 5% and 6%. And the projection is that the industry will keep growing 5% per year. So I think there's a huge opportunity for the digital asset space in that sector. Thank you. Greg? My name is Greg Waisaki. I lead a hedge fund sales team for Coinbase. I've uh, been there about three years. Prior to that, I had 20 plus years experience in uh, traditional finance, um, starting in equities and then in macro, servicing um, some of the largest hedge funds and asset managers in the world. Um, I would say uh, similarly, I, I, I think the stablecoin use case is probably one that's the most tangible, has one of the largest TAMs of any use case that I can come up with. and. Um, uh, it's, it's one that even my, my parents can understand, so that, that excites me. Hey, everybody. My name is uh, Dan Husher. I'm the Chief Data Product Officer at Luca. I've um, been with the organization for about two and a half years. Um, come from more of a traditional finance background, data more specifically. Um, spent 16 years at a company called IHS Market. Uh, that's now part of S&P Global, but uh, I guess looking back, pretty boring. You know, just did data my entire career. <laughs> um, Aluka itself provides both data and data management software to pretty much any um, ecosystem participant. So this is from miners to traders. Uh, and if we're going to sum up uh, Luca in one sentence, we're essentially bridging the gap between the you know, complexities of blockchain and, and, and crypto and traditional business needs. Um, in terms of my favorite crypto use case, uh, Chris, if you were to ask me this several years ago, I would say the Oracle. Um, and I realize probably showing a little bit of a familiarity bias here, uh, given that I like data and I've worked in data my entire career, that 
I like the Oracle, but that's quickly being replaced by... Can you explain what an Oracle is for everyone, Dan? Yeah, sure. Uh, an, an Oracle, um, in, in layman's terms, is a mechanism that would essentially take data um, off-chain and bring it on-chain for it to be used you know, within the ecosystem um, by different protocols. Um, so it's, it's, it's a way that data can be managed and distributed and used you know, with, with, within the ecosystem. So, uh, but this is quickly being replaced by uh, the tokenization of real world assets. So you know, putting into perspective now, right, when we have kind of you know, 2020 vision, so to speak, in the, in the past, you know, looking at you know, the securities market in the United States, 2017-ish, you know, moving from three days of settlement to two days of settlement, like that, that was a big deal, right? Now you look at it, it's like two days of settlement. It's, it's like the movement of like, it makes a glacier look quick, right? So, um, you know, things like this can happen in a blockchain, right? So, you know, tokenization of real world assets and, and what it means for essentially eliminating counterparty risk. Chris Ryan at Galaxy. I run the uh, asset management liquid uh, actively managed strategies. Uh, Galaxy Asset Management now has uh, somewhere around three and a half billion in AUM. Um, prior to that, I spent 10 years at Cohen and Steers uh, managing a, a number of different equity portfolios. And uh, prior to that, I was at uh, BlackRock for about 12 years as well. In terms of favorite use case, um, it's not necessarily a use case. It's more of a feature of, of blockchains. And that's that everything is, is publicly verifiable um, and everything on the blockchain is truth. So it's very easy to uh, determine transactions. It's very easy to verify identity. Um, and to the point made earlier, these transactions are, are cleared on a blockchain, depending on which one, uh, close to real time. So there is no long waiting period to be able to verify a transaction's occurred. You can see it on a blockchain explorer quite quickly. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to set the stage before we start to talk about some of these use cases, before, before we start to talk about asset management and the evolution within digital assets, um, for where we are today, because we've been in a bear market for perhaps two years, and it's funny to say that considering Bitcoin is up over 100% this year, but it still very much feels like we're in a uh, a headwind environment and not a tailwind environment, despite the fact that we're seeing increasing use cases, despite the fact that we're seeing uh, uh, very successful performance year to date. Um, so maybe um, somebody could, could take this and start to contextualize what's happened over the last few years in the regulatory environment, and of course this, this big SBF court case that hopefully is fully behind us now. Um, can you tell us where we're at with respect to the the current innings of of this um, of the of the sentiment of the sentiment here in uh, the, in the U.S. for crypto, I guess I will, I'll start. Uh, I would call it like the perfect storm. And to really understand what's going on today, we have to go back, you know, in like 2016 or 17. Um, I think the sentiment in those years, there was a lot of speculation about the markets and tokens, and people were investing just based on the crazy returns that we were seeing in the market. But without understanding, like I think Jackie mentioned in the previous, mar previous panel, where this alpha was coming from, and the really underlying value of those investments and the tokens. Uh, now I think the space has evolved because of everything that has been happening with a lot of like really centralized exchanges falling apart. Not really, they're not really based on blockchain at all. And the regulators paying more attention to it. Um, I think now last year, this year actually, uh, 2023, we've seen a lot of news through every single month, you know, of like big institutions participating in the space and putting together partnerships and collaborations with more like crypto companies like Coinbase. And I think that's very important. So I think the sentiment right now is like we're waiting on the silence, sidelines to participate in the space. Once there is a robust and clear legal framework in the US, but it's wanted. I think a clear indicator of that is BlackRock filing for the ETF. And I think it's just a matter of time for the ETF to be approved, and then the volume obviously will increase in the space. Thank you. Anyone else? Chris? I'll go next. I mean, you know, the one thing that we see in the market and why it doesn't feel like it's improved much is, is because volumes have been so anemic. Um, 
In fact, if you look at volumes uh, all year, Q1 was uh, somewhat supported by a bit of a surge in Bitcoin, um, thanks to the banking crisis. But volumes, uh, particularly on and off exchange every quarter, have been lower each quarter. Now, clearly, uh, October has kind of changed fortunes a little bit. Um, we, we've started to see um, volumes pick up, and, and more recently, even in some of the non-Bitcoin, non-ETH coins and the altcoins. Um, but, you know, in, in general, there's still just a lot of skeptics. Um, there's a lot of people on the sideline who would prefer to wait until there is more certainty before dabbling their feet in. It's feedback we hear quite frequently. And you also have a lot of retail participants who, you know, they got faked out once, they got faked out twice, and they're like, you know, I'm, I'm not getting faked out again. I'm just going to wait until there's certainty. And that's why I think this ETF, uh, you know, uh, spot ETF approval would, would go a long way to kind of easing some of both the regulatory concerns and these fake out concerns that the retail public have. Yeah, I would agree with that just to, to build on. I, I certainly think the, you know, the regulatory headwinds I think that we've been facing here in the U.S. is feeling like it's starting to thaw. Um, and eventually I think we'll get past it. But just to put it into perspective, it's um, it's not like that everywhere in the world. So, like, we're seeing quite a bit of um, demand, particularly in, in the LATAM space and, and out of APAC as well. Yeah, I, I, I think FTX is, is a really, really hard thing to get over. Um, but we are getting there. Um, you know, one out of three congressmen took money from, from FTX. Um, and the, the aftermath felt... Um, very specific, like these enforcement actions that have been happening against every single crypto company, it feels like, have been um, not the same response after the Madoff scandal, for example. After Madoff, we didn't uh, go after every single hedge fund. And after Enron, we didn't go after every single oil and gas company. But it certainly has felt like the, the regulatory overhang is laser focused and, and Gary Gensler's la laser focus on crypto, which has put everyone, you know, kind of in the penalty box for institutions. I, I feel like a lot of them are doing their homework. They're getting ready for potential allocations. Um, but it's put a lot of folks on hold. Um, but I would like to maybe ask, ask you, um, Greg, this is um, really your wheelhouse here. What are institutions, how are they, maybe can you give, give us a picture? What have they invested in? I think they kind of took a big pause for the last year or so in allocations. What are they looking at? What are they, what are they talking about? Uh, yeah, I, I think I'd take a step back and say that uh, FTX last year, I, th I think, marked um, the peak in, um, uh, in, in private sentiment. If you look at the attribution of returns for uh, VC and private equity for many years, a lot of the uh, performance was coming from blockchain and crypto-related private investments. Um, so I think that took the wind out of the sails, not just from a public... Uh, liquid token perspective, but also from uh, uh, the, the private investment side as well. Um, fast forward to today, I would say that uh, the largest headwind that we see in terms of allocating to the space, whether it be from the liquid or private side, is, is really the regulatory picture. And uh, when will we have that regulatory clarity? Um, I, I think, you know, the rest of the world is probably more bullish on crypto than, than the U.S. For, for a lot of those reasons. Um, but also just the way that uh, we characterized, you know, the investment um, in the room, um, we've seen more uh, investment professionals own it personally than, than they have actually for their funds uh, for, or their LPs. And, and when I think about some of the reasons why uh, I hear that are, it's, it's really two folds. One, um, that the asset class is still very new and uh, we're, we're learning how to invest uh, on, on behalf of investors. Uh, two, that the market structure is still evolving. Um, you know, the advent of an ETF would um, really help market structure. It would bring forth a lot, new, a lot of new market participants, which I think we need, um, just from a commercial hedging perspective, uh, market makers, um, it, it would bring forth that institu institutionalization of, of this market um, that I think is going to be necessary. And then lastly, I would say, um, when you look at the use cases, just even over the last three years that I've been at Coinbase, we've seen a number of different uh, use cases uh, 
come in and out of vogue as a result of what's going on from a regulatory perspective. And, and specifically, maybe we could just stick with you, Greg. What are the institu What are institutions? How are they invested? Um, are they invested through through tokens, through funds, through fund to funds? What is what does it typically look like? What is first step, second step, more diversified portfolios? <clears throat> sure, I would say that uh, you know, looking backwards in the 2019, 2020 time frame, a lot of the um, institutional managers looked a lot like VC funds, um, all with a, a, a long bias, um, all with very convex returns, but uh, not a lot of risk management. Today, we have folks like Chris who you know bring uh, a wealth of knowledge and, and, and real risk management um, and, and alpha generation to the space, which um, is a far cry from you know what it's been historically. I saw a, a stat actually that Galaxy posted that just 10% of the funds today um, in the crypto space, hedge funds, um, have uh, a track record going back before 2019. So you don't have um, a lot of funds with a, a huge track record here. But those that are, I think uh, it, it speaks to their ability to manage capital. So answering your question, I, I, th I see a lot of uh, family offices that are long um, spot in a lot of cases just for that long-term exposure. Um, we've seen uh, macro funds come in and out of the space either for directional exposure as a replacement for gold, um, depending on their view on real rates. Um, we've seen a lot of basis trading. Basis uh, has come in and out of vogue, um, but you have to be set up there to, to actually trade and take advantage. And then uh, I would say there's a lot of uh, crossover funds that will own tokens um, either by way of a, a VC distribution or as a long-term thematic play in the case of, say, ETH for a Web3 um, uh, uh, thematic position. Yeah. Yeah, one point on, on short track records. What's interesting, they always talk about crypto being in dog years, right? Like worth eight years eight years to one. So a three-year track record in crypto <laughs> perhaps is worth like a 20-year a track record for a traditional long short equity fund. All the ups and downs and, and uh, peaks and troughs are already in there. Um, Chris, can we continue this conversation just about institutions? Galaxy touches so many institutions. Uh, you probably talk to every investor and potential investor in in digital assets all around the world. Um, what is the lay of the land today? How are uh, investors thinking about allocations to crypto? So if, if we would have had this conversation a month ago, I, I would say it's, it's still very bleak. Um, most people prefer to sit on the sidelines, um, a lot of wait and see. Um, and a lot of people who just continue to kind of punt the decision. Um, and, and each you know, different institution or investor has their own unique reasoning from it's not in my benchmark to it's high risk, it's too much vol, we don't have any liquid capital to, to actually even commit right now. There's the gamut. Um, over the last month, I would say that things have definitely changed. Um, Speaking to uh, some, some large institutions um, in the US where even the internal climate, they said, had gone from hostile to lukewarm. Um, and actually, we see it in our, our flow data as well. Um, they're, they're, the, the inflows have definitely started to pick up, and that is very much a recent phenomenon. I think people are starting to get a little bit more excited that hey, you know, Bitcoin is definitely here to stay. Um, this spot ETF isn't any longer about an if, it's just a matter of when. Um, and a lot of people are, are then just suspecting that, well, once Bitcoin is done, since Ethereum has a futures fund or ETFs already, it's only a matter of time until a spot, you know, Ether um, uh, ETF is available too. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of different viewpoints into the altcoins that is still a little bit hazy. Um, there are definitely investors who say there's 20,000 tokens and a lot of them are nonsense. And I wouldn't sit here and disagree with that. Um, there is still a lot of nonsense out there because it's very simple for an issuer of a token to issue a token. Um, Unlike you know the tech boom and the IPO boom of the of the late 90s, you had a lot of regulatory hurdles you had to go through to be able to actually 
um, issue a security and IPO it. <laughs> in crypto, um, it's unfortunately extremely easy. Um, and this is one of the biggest issues that we saw was a lot of uh, fraudulent activity where people would you know, promote these projects and uh, in crypto layman terms, they're called rug pools. They, they're not actually legitimate protocols. So I think you know, as we continue to move more into this regulatory clarity side, it's only going to improve the institutional appetite and it will also protect investors from a lot of these projects that have been launched that are illegitimate and really shouldn't be getting capital. Um, but I am kind of excited that over the past, you know, 30, 40 days, um, the activity and interest in investing, um, as we've seen it, has, has turned pretty sharply. And Chris, you are an active manager? Right, so your strategy um, is in liquid tokens and equivalent to what a long short equity hedge fund would be doing um, uh, you're a coin picker to their stock picking. Yeah, so this is interesting. Um, can you tell me us a little bit more about the interest in your specific strategy? Because from my understanding, institutions, they, they, they're they really comfortable putting crypto and uh, digital assets in the VC bucket. Because we all know how that works, the binary nature, the asymmetry of kind of setting it and forgetting it. And the very fact that crypto is so such a highly volatile asset class that uh, I'm sure you're doing a great job on risk management, but, but nevertheless, it's gonna be higher of all than, than, than bonds, right? Um, and it gets so much scrutiny in investment committees and we talk about the line item and why is this manager down 15%? Well, it's, it's got a sharp ratio of three and it's targeting of all of 20 and it's doing great actually, even though it's down 15. These are like more nuanced discussions that just get pushed under the rug when, when crypto is in a bear market, right? Um, so from my understanding, institutions are still, they still like the VC approach, they still like the private's approach. Um, but t talk a little bit about um, the evolution of the liquid side. I think why liquid has gotten a lot more airtime recently is because, um, you know, many people probably sitting in the audience know, uh, liquidity has a real value to it when you can't get liquidity in any other area in your portfolio. And to Greg's point, early on, the primary investment vehicles in crypto were in venture. And many of these funds had anywhere from seven to 10 year lockup periods. So even if you were amazing and invested in these funds in 2017, you haven't been able to really, you know, harvest profits from that. Um, you've been locked in this fund with the terms. I think the approach to crypto now is, okay, venture makes sense, as it should in any portfolio, but given the volatility in the asset class, we should have liquid buckets, either in ETFs or passives or actives, as long as they have uh, you know, no lockups and easy redemptions, to complement that venture. And that way, if we do get another crypto bull market and you know, asset prices are up a couple hundred percent, we can use that liquid sleeve to de-risk our crypto exposure and actually take profits on kind of the capital appreciation side. So it's a different way that investors are looking at balancing kind of an illiquid and liquid approach. Now, I do agree the altcoin side of things is still uh, very difficult. And there are a number of you know, great liquid managers out there, but they take more of a VC approach with the token. So it's much more smaller cap, um, illiquid side. You know, the way that we've structured our funds is, is much more blue chip um, and risk managed. We manage the vol of our fund to the vol of Bitcoin. Um, and we could do that with cash and options and other things. But it's trying to, to make sure that risk is kind of central to what we're doing, but also focusing on what we think are blue chip protocols that actually have a legitimate team, a, leg a legitimate kind of pathway to, to future scale and, and future profitability as well. Um, keeping on this topic, Paula, can we shift to institutional interest in fund to funds? Um, this is a topic um, dear to my heart as well. I think it's probably the smartest, diverse, most diversified approach. Um, have you seen interest renewed over the past month? How That's is this a year great been? question. I think before I get into that, it's important to understand that in the digital asset space, I, we have observed like two 
two separate barbells of investors. One is like what I call the crypto wealthy, the people that participated in the space early on, and they generated a lot of wealth investing you know, in Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, and they're holding the crypto. And the second one is a traditional investor, the ones that I believe as a fund of funds will be our sweet spot. And it makes sense, right, for foundations, endowments to participate in the space. Unless you have the technical expertise and the traditional finance expertise, you should not try to deploy capital directly. That's my perception. Um, similar to Chris, I, I agree in the last few months, I see the sentiment changing. I think a lot of like the largest alloc allocators in 2021, they felt FOMO, maybe a little bit of greed, and I want to be nice about it, but in 2021, they wanted to deploy capital, participate in the space without really conducting a profound due diligence, and a lot of them lost a lot of capital. Some of them even like 90%. So that's why, you know, they, they are been sitting on the sidelines in this cycle, and they're not deploying capital. The sentiment is changing, but I don't think fast enough. And one of the things that I want to say, you know, for the allocators in this room is, is an invitation to come into the space before the next bull market. Take your time doing due diligence and understanding where you're going and allocate your capital. I think it's very important. Yeah. Can I just stick on the fund to funds approach for, for one second? I always felt that when you look back on the history of hedge funds, it's the early 90s that was really the heyday for, for fund to funds. Um, it was easier to do manager selection. Alpha was more plentiful. And you could create a very good portfolio that was very robust um, across different strategies, across different asset classes. Um, and I feel like we're in that golden era right now for digital assets. And I, I, I see institutions who are uncertain about different risks within their portfolio taking this approach, right? Like on a look-through basis, you have, call it a dozen to 20 managers. On a look-through basis there, you have hundreds and hundreds of positions, derivatives and futures, um, and a lot of different, different diversified exposures. And if you believe in the asset class, if you believe in the beta, you can get a diversified beta to all the different subsectors, right? To, to GameFi and Metaverse and infrastructure, and you name it, all the different strategies can be exposed. Or you can um, have it on a market neutral basis as well, right? You could even have it so that all of the alpha kind of percolates to the top, and you're stripping away as many identifiable betas as you can. Um, so I'm with you. Um, uh, Dan, I want to switch to you. Um, you are deep in the woods on data and software in blockchain. And really, it's the, the most important thing about blockchain is that it's transparent and open. Um, and that is all about data. And there's more and more data. Um, so please tell us, like, from your perspective, what are um, the biggest trends that are happening and what's exciting in, in your neck of the woods in crypto right now? Yeah, sure. So I guess taking a step back, just you know, thinking about how, how markets evolve, and you know, Greg, you alluded to this around kind of the institutionalization and kind of the maturation of the you know of the marketplace, and you know, we've seen this with traditional finance as well over the last you know call it 50 or 60 years. You know, markets become more sophisticated um, to succeed in markets that become more sophisticated. You need to become more sophisticated. That involves you know better data collection, better data processing. Um, not only just that, but you also need to select providers that can actually scale with you. Um, and that's one of the reasons why people among many like to work with Luke and what, what we found is, you know, the ability to continue to expand and meet customer needs on the data side, um, you know, for their business. So um, I guess where, where we're really going with this is it doesn't matter if you are, you know, pre-trade or post-trade or, or anywhere in between. It doesn't matter really where you sit in the house front you know, front office, middle office, or back office, you know, at the end of the day, you know, data drives a lot of things across what every business does, right? So you either run your business with it day to day, uh, you make informed decisions about your business, um, or really just focus on growing your business and making decisions, right? So, you know, the role of data is becoming, um, you know, more perverse, and what we're seeing in the marketplace going back several years, 
you know, you would take a handful of data sets, but what we're seeing particularly from our hedge fund customers is they're wanting more data. Uh, they're wanting higher you know, volumes of data. They want the data quicker than what they previously did. Um, and they also want us to continue to push our data sets in new areas that it hasn't been before, right? Particularly one of them is being risk management. So again, just to build on, on two things that, that Greg really mentioned that, that resonated was, um, the one, the, the kind of institutionalization of the marketplace, uh, but also you know, a more focus on, on, on risk management as well. So you know, given some of our core data sets, you, know, you mentioned about sector classifications. We have sector classifications that leads to index construction. Uh, and now we're also seeing more, um, more demand for risk-based data sets as well. Um, and again, I think that's, that's attuned to kind of the, the market maturing. Dan, you, you spent your career doing fintech and data on the traditional finance side. What is it about this side, the blockchain? It's, it's transparent, it's open perhaps, but what, what is so exciting about blockchain data? It's so diverse, and I think this came up in um, one of the previous panels was, I think it was the gentleman from, uh, from, from Coinbase actually, uh, the, the institutional research, um, thought it was going to be very, you know, a, a, a benefit to work with so much data, but then they realized how difficult it actually is to work with the data. Um, and quite frankly, is one of the reasons why, why we have products is our customers have come to us to solve problems, right? So why people think, you know, everything is on chain, I can see everything, it's immutable, it is the truth, I can see all through history. Um, you know, decentralization brings a lot of benefits in it. I don't think any up, anybody up here would contest that. But what it doesn't bring is standards, right? So while you think the data is all readable on chain, without standard setters or um, you know, normalization of data, it can actually be incredibly difficult to work with, right? When, when you move beyond Bitcoin and you know, some of the exchanges, they don't even agree on what the Bitcoin ticker is, you know, depending on, and you're talking about the largest asset, right? So as you get down the rabbit hole, you see that the rabbit holes have rabbit holes and it gets actually quite complex, right? An example of this is uh, what we refer to as crypto actions, right? Which is uh, corporate actions or, or crypto's equivalent of corporate actions, right? So you see um, a crypto action that take place could be a hard fork, it could be a redenomination or something of this nature, but not all the exchanges will behave in the same manner, right? So, so some may support the new asset, some may not. Um, if exchanges do behave in the same way, they may not do so at the same time, right? So you start to kind of get down the spider web of, of difficulty and, you know, we have dedicated teams that, that literally focus on this day in and day out. Um, and it allows our customers to, again, focus on growing their business and less on the data logistics. I want to jump around a little bit to um, operational risks on behalf of institutional investors who are looking for allocations in, in digital assets because perhaps um, it's very easy to make an investment case for digital assets. Uh, huge TAM or low-hanging fruit for alpha. Um, the where you get tripped up, though, in investing in crypto is usually on the operation side. We've had so many problems with centralized exchanges and, and hacks on bridges, et cetera. There's a lot of risks there. So um, you could argue that operational due diligence is more important than investment due diligence in this new niche asset class. Um, and I'm sure this is the question you get a lot. So I'd love to hear um, how you answer it, what you think. Well, it has changed and evolved. And I see that as a very positive change in the industry. Uh, we have to remember when we started our company in 2017, there were not vendors or service providers for crypto. Nobody wanted to touch us. And I come from a background of traditional finance where even the administrator was Citco. So when I started the fund, I thought it was going to be very easy, and it wasn't. We were not even able to open a bank account because banks didn't understand crypto at all. Um, Likewise, you know, with ODD companies, you know, they will not understand crypto and a lot of the companies were charging us like $15,000 per due diligence on each hedge fund manager, but they didn't even know what questions to ask or even look at their processes. So we have to do it our own and we have built a very robust ODD process. Um, Again, at the beginning, many of the managers, they wouldn't share with us their data. They wouldn't even tell us, you know, what was the cost to the solution they were using or the exchanges. 
And, but there were so many few managers in the space that sometimes we were like pushed or obligated to deploy capital in these managers. Now it's different. Like we really take the time. We have, again, a very robust system. We ask quantitative and qualitative questions, you know, and we have a rating system. And after that, we meet with them in person. We have periodical calls. We review the statements. We review where they're generating the alpha and what are their service providers they're using in the space. And we have calls and even meetings with these service providers. You really have to go deep into the processes of each manager, and it takes time. Chris, what, um, continuing on this theme, what are the questions, if, if you have an uh, experienced hedge fund investor who knows long short equity, what are the questions he should ask you about the operational side of of your fund? What are the themes? Well, I think it, very clearly where and how do you trade um, because trading on exchanges and trading offshore is, is very different than trading with trusted OTC counterparties. Um, and that can open a Pandora's box to risk as well, um, particularly given that we've had a number of exchanges which have shut down. Um, I would think the second is, uh, do I even recognize the name of your banking partner here? Um, because as, as Paulo mentioned, it is hard for certain crypto funds to get banked. Um, luckily, we, we got uh, Boney set up um, right in advance of, uh, of March because a lot of people were struggling uh, in, uh, in that time frame to get banking uh, counterparties set up. Um, you know, I think in any, any hedge fund manager, they're always thinking about risk versus reward, sharp ratios. And any manager that won't tell you what their monthly volatility is or, or when, what markets they think they should do well in, um, that's a big red flag. Um, you know, crypto has enough risk already. And if you, know, you want to invest in a crypto hedge fund or a crypto long only, it's very easy to get passive exposure with Bitcoin right now. So, you know, what's the sharp ratio of this hedge fund net of fees relative to, to just owning Bitcoin? And if there's no good reason for that, um, most likely they're not going to share the data with you because they know that. So those are some of the red flags that I would look out for whenever you're talking to, uh, to potential managers. Great. Thank you. We just have a few minutes left. Um, I would like everyone to have uh, one last um, one last comment, perhaps, but maybe, Greg, could you start and tell us anything you're excited about for, for 2024, what the year ahead looks like for us? Uh, yeah, there's I, a lot of reasons to be excited from my seat, but um, you know, I would say, number one, uh, regulatory clarity. Uh, number two, the potential for an ETF and all the uh, things that that brings from a market structure perspective. Um, Number three, this is more of a, 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 a macro call out, but um, just the way Bitcoin has acted in the face of tightening financial conditions this year, uh, rising real rates, um, we're going into a, a halving cycle. Um, I believe this is the first one that uh, we've ever gone into where we haven't been in um, you know, a QE regime. So um, I'm interested to see uh, uh, how, how the market responds there. And um, yeah, I think when you look at the performance of, of Bitcoin just this year in the face of those conditions, that stands out to me and to a lot of other macro managers that, I, that I've talked to. So I'm excited to see a continuation of that. Great. Thank you. Um, Paula? I think two main things, as I mentioned at the beginning, partnerships and participation of traditional finance with crypto companies and funds. And the second, the synergy between blockchain and artificial intelligence to improve the ecosystem and make it more efficient, especially for the layer ones. Thank you, Dan. Um, say tokenization of real world assets, maybe a little bit of a you know, selfishness, but it's, it's a chance for kind of my previous life and my, my, my new life kind of, you know, you know, in traditional finance and, and now digital assets, starting to see them overlap and, um, you know, really start to bring, you know, a, a lot of benefits to kind of traditional finance. Absolutely. Chris? I would think it's seeing all these RIA platforms and wealth managers get Bitcoin in their models. Um, you know, everyone needs to, to have a benchmark reason to own something. Um, not everyone, some people. Um, and, and seeing 
you know, a Bitcoin allocation in your standard model deck when you're, you know, investing client assets, um, that opens up a very significant door that I think would, would help um, really introduce people to crypto, get them a bit more interested, and hopefully continue along the knowledge, uh, you know, curve with crypto, just given the amount of misinformation in media, news, and even politics um, about the asset class. Agreed. Well, thank you, Chris, Dan, Greg, and Paula. Um, and thank you all. Um, have a great day.